TV Grace presents the inexpressible words of God, the gospel of grace on the lips of Jesus Christ men. Abba Father. Let's redeem our time. <laughs> Let's go to second letter of the Apostle Paul to Timothy. Chapter 2. You know that in the Old Testament, there is a biblical verse that, that Moses tells Joshua, I command you to be strong and of good courage. Because there you had to, if you didn't make an effort, it was pure works. And if you had no works, things didn't go well. But here there's a different type of courage. Look how it begins. Verse 1, are we all there? You, therefore, my son, Paul would speak to Timothy as a son because he was the father, the second father. Abraham was the first, Paul the second of his time. He says, well, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And notice that the word strong, you can apply it in the aspect that you must be strong to enter God's rest. In not doing works. Be strong in being relaxed. Notice what type of courage it's apply here. It's different to the old covenant because here it is the good battle of faith. You have to maintain yourself in faith at all times. And it says the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself in the affairs of this life that he may please him that enlisted him as a soldier. And he that competes as an athlete is not crowned unless he competes legitimately. The farmer, in order to take part of the fruit, he must labor first. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. That's what the Lord revealed to me this, this evening. Consider what I tell you, and may God give you understanding in all things. I looked up understanding, so then the first point I want to make is suffer hardship. Everyone whose eyes are enlightened and enters into this revelation begins to speak different. And he begins to see the things and from a different point of view to others, from the mother, the uncles, the aunts, uh, uh, friends from work. So on account of that, you begin to suffer penalties. It isn't that you allow to prevent hardship. You can't uh, not defend yourself. Uh, if you suffer penalties, don't defend yourself. Persecution, murmuring. Because they're going to come because of what you repent, what you represent. Everyone here is called to walk in works prepared beforehand. But everyone he calls to those works beforehand suffer hardship. Can be the husband that may not understand or the wife or the children that don't understand the family or maybe the church that you left behind that begin to to speak against you for belonging to this ministry, there you suffer penalties. That you are where? In growing in grace. How did you dare arrive there? It's not that a how I dare, how they brought me there, they dragged me there, because no one comes here. You didn't come here. They brought you here. God used different means, and he brought you. Because this is a unique word. Nowhere in the planet Earth they speak as we speak here, or think as we think here, and that you should know. So you are called to live a life of rest, to be strong in grace. You need to remember grace at all times. Today, you were courageous to get prepared and come here. Instead of listening to a cassette at home, you made the effort to come here to maintain yourself updated on the revelation. So when that happens, 
Your life begins to be molded. Your thoughts begin to be exercised in the discernment of good and evil. The mind, they possess it, and it begins a process of decontamination. Paul says that we should cleanse ourselves from all contamination of flesh and spirit. And the spirit doesn't get contaminated, but what it's trying to say is erroneous things that you think that they're spiritual and they are garbage from that religious system. Concepts. For an example, when you arrived here for the first time, you said, I like this, but I don't accept that. And then two months later, you say, oh, how clear that is, because what you accepted in the beginning was a stumbling block to the contamination you brought in. And now you say, wow, that is so simple. It's like that of the apostleship. That is the stumbling block. Oh, everything is good, but that of uh, acknowledging that apostle, that's idolatry. That is... And that is uh, contamination, religious contamination, because you think it's idolatry. Idolatry is that when you give recognition to a man that is continuously abusing you. But to reckon those that work before us, to honor their work, that ain't idolatry. There is wisdom in that. Because... He has edified your life. Idolatry is that you go to the Pope and kiss his ring with a big head like that that's never taught you anything. <laughs> <laughs> that what he's done is infected the nations with religiosity, selling them rosaries, scapulars. How are you going to reckon something like that when that Garbage, religious garbage is what's caused all of this divisiveness all around the world. What kind of peace are you going to find there? So then, that is the contamination. There is an advice on Psalms 139, and that's in the shadow. But because David was predestined and he spoke prophetically, Psalms 139, the Psalms that I recommend, if you can go there in the scriptures, and then we'll return to the second letter of Timothy. So don't lose sight. Look at how precious this Psalm, what beautiful counsel. why and for what reason you should rest and suffer hardship that come on account of the grace you're learning. Are we all there? Yes. I'm going to begin. It says, O oh Lord, there it says, O oh Jehovah, but because I'm educated and submitted to the Apostle Paul. Hello. Paul never used the term Jehovah. You should neither, because he said, what you saw of me and learned of me and heard of me, do. So I, for the respect I have to my apostle, when I see Jehovah, I say, I can't say that. I have to say Lord, because Jehovah changed his name. That was a name that he put on for the shadow. But don't call him according to the shadow. Call him conform to light. If you can. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You have known my sitting down and my raising up. All predestined children and elect can say this, that you can get up, go to bed. The Lord has his eye on you. That gives you such a peace. When you know that he's watching over you, that you get up with your hair all messed up and crusty, there's the Lord with you. <laughs> you understand my thoughts are far off. Hello. You know that Solomon said, many are the plans in a person's heart. But above all, the Lord's purpose is what prevails. For an example, to Jonah, 
Many thoughts came through his mind. I'm going to Nineveh. That was one thought. I'm going to buy the ticket. The second thought. I accomplished it. The third thought. I escaped. The fourth thought. Now I left behind all of those people. The fifth thought. What he didn't count on was the sixth thought. Hey, big fish. That was going to swallow him. So sometimes you think that you can do whatever you want. You think, I'm going to the U.S. and I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm tired of this family that's always supervising me. <laughs> so then you think, so you think that you accomplished it and here the Lord grabbed you. And he did with you, made some changes in your life. You, you don't own your life. You don't govern your life. He comes to your life at the age of 10, 15, 20, 30, 40. Even the elderly, he catches up with and supports them until their gray hairs. He's the one that chooses and governs. You're sitting down, you're raising up, rising up, and your thoughts. Look how precious. You scrutinize my path and my lying down. Scrutinize. It's not just over the top. He knows the places in which you encounter. Your path. He's seen you there. And there he needs to take care of you. There where you go, and he has to care for you. When I was young, I used to go to some hot joints. One day, they threw me out on the curve as a dead man. He's dead, but the Lord was there watching my path. He takes care of his own. There are others he let die. This one is not necessary for right now. I'm going to take him to the cloud of witnesses so he can be a witness of what's going on down here. Others, he delivers them from accidents and infirmities because he does as he wish with his elect. So then it says, and all of my ways, you are acquainted with them. <laughs> Hello, he's acquainted. For the word is not in my tongue and behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. Notice that he knows what you're going to fabricate in your mind, he knows. Behind and in front, you encircled me. Behind Michael and in front, Gabriel. They have you surrounded by angels who can come against you. Hello. <laughs> How beautiful it is to have a testimony like that with you i know that he is with me and sometimes in your mind you say how far can i stretch the rope and there the lord is guiding you it says and you've placed your hand upon me such knowledge is too wonderful for me it's it is high I cannot attain it. You know that you can say, I can understand it, because you've come to know the hidden wisdom, the predestined wisdom, not him. David couldn't speak like that. Prophetically, they gave him very little. They couldn't give him more because that was reserved for the Apostle Paul. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where... Can I go from your spirit? Where can I hide from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, you will arrive to Puerto Rico. <laughs> I'm saying from where he wrote this. And also to Colombia, Cartagena. <laughs> Even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall guide me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me. Even the night shall be light about me. How he cares, blessed. Who can come against you? Even dead you are a blessing. Even dead. They 
cover you. Even in the midst of darkness, the light shines because you are an elect of God. <laughs> Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Now listen. Because you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you because formidable and marvelous are your works. I am marvel, and that my soul knoweth very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret woven Together in the depth of the earth, my eyes, hello, that's where the spirit is. My embryum saw my gemination upon the scriptures and scribes scheduled for me, for my formation before one of them came to be. How precious also are your thoughts to me. Oh God, how great the sum of them. If I should count them, they shall be more in number than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. That is a precious psalm that helps you to resist any situation. To suffer hardship. Suffer hardship. It doesn't say to avoid them, to suffer them, that you should swallow them, endure them. How is everything going? Well, suffer hardship. Let's go to the second letter of Timothy. Let's go back. Now, the second point, we spoke of the first, suffer penalties as a good soldier. A soldier knows that he isn't the commander of the war. He is directed and they care for him. So the apostle gives an example of a good soldier that you should learn how to fight the good battle of faith. Now, number two, do not get tangled in the affairs of the world. You know that years ago when they would preach this to me, don't get involved in business. No, it doesn't say not to get involved. It says not to tangle yourself. You have to be involved in business. Business is good. There is finance there. There is prosperity. But what you can't do is get entangled. You have to know with whom you are associated and you can't allow that the affairs of life steal your time from the Lord. Because there are folks that have a business. And, oh, no, I can't go to church. When can you go? Never. Well, then you're entangled. No, it's, I don't have time for that. Well, imagine a week has 168 hours. And if you sleep eight a day, seven times eight, 56, you're still left with uh, 100, I don't know how many hours, 108 hours. And if you work 40, 50, 60, you still have 40, I don't know how many hours I can add right now. <laughs> and listen, to work 60 hours is a lot, but you don't have the time to instruct your spirit. Well, then you're angled up. Say, he's tangled up. Say, I do not get tangled up. You have to make time for the Lord. For what? So that the Lord can make time for you. When you get into a transaction and it's confusing, you say, Lord, I'm not entangled. I put my time in your things and the angel will say, well, I have them in yours. Easy. I have encircled you behind and in front. Hello. That protection is tremendous. You know that I, for this ministry, when I uh, begun this ministry, I had this console in my spirit. And I knew what was going to come. I knew that I was going to be criticized. I was going to suffer hardship, that the members were going to come against me. The Lord told me, 
Keep yourself. Preach and separate yourself. Preach and separate yourself. Don't drink coffee with no one. Don't go out to eat with anyone. I didn't send you to go eat with anyone. No, it's that the pastors have to go and eat with the flock. Listen, when you have a, an attorney, do you have to eat with the attorney so the attorney can render his service? The dentist, he has to go to your house to pull the tooth? Publix, the public go to your house to take inventory? What you have in the refrigerator? So why can't in the business of God, you can be more wisdom? So the Lord advise me don't get entangled with no one because people will come to me hey i have a business here and uh, half of it of uh, the uh the profit is for you if, uh, if we sell three cars two of the profits i receive would be for the ministry listen <laughs> no i deal with tithing and offerings i can't get entangled in selling cars i know how to do my job and i want to do it right i love what i what i like to do when we were doing a transaction, a millionaire t transaction, with uh, this entrepreneur, we started talking about the word and the gentleman we were negotiating with told me, I don't understand that about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why people are so confused with that? Simply because they are before the cross and before the cross, God himself were confused. He would say, my Father will send the Spirit. My father is greater than I. The spirit my father will send. So they would think that there were three. But after the cross, Paul resumed everything. And he said, brethren, great is the mystery of deity. God was manifest in flesh. It is to say, who was the flesh? God. It doesn't say the Son was manifest in flesh. It says God was manifested in the flesh. But that was before the cross. And he hid that so that he would be crucified. Because if he had revealed it, they wouldn't have crucified him. You think that the disciples would have denied him? No, but he had to confuse them with that of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My Father is greater than I. The Spirit will come upon you. It was him. That's why when Philip questioned him and said, well, this is, I was confused. Who is it? Show us the Father, you big head. Don't you know that the Father is within me? Listen, learn. He straightened it out. And listen, and I took this man I was sharing with, and I, uh, and he said, thank you. You know that I was confused with that? Well, don't conf be confused anymore. After the cross, and he, the second meeting we had, I brought my uh, armor with me. I brought my Bible, and I uh, gave him a task. I wrote all the verses, and before entering the, his business, I said, this is the assignment I want you to read Romans 7, 4, Hebrews 6, 1, 2 Corinthians 5, 16. And he looked at it like this. Oh, I'm going to read it. Well, okay, we're done. Let's do business. Be strong in grace. Take opportunity. You have to be prepared there to sow the word. So then you are going to get involved in the businesses of life, but you're not going to get tangled up. Anything your hand can get that is right, do it. And another thing, to get to where you want to get to, don't step over no one. People say, oh, I am triumphant, but you step upon 20 individuals behind you. Because you know that there are folks that deceive, they hurt others. I'm going to lie here to get to that place. And there they lie again to get to another. It has to be legitimate, legitimately. The athlete to be crowned, he has to compete legitimately. Don't fool your brother. Nor steal from him. Nor borrow knowing that you're not going to pay him back. You can't do that. I'm saying, and if it's happened, and you can ask for forgiveness, I didn't intend this, uh, I'll look for a way to straighten this out. 
But if you're going to get involved or involve yourself with the affairs of life, be faithful. Because God is going to back that up. And God will back it up when you are faithful in principle, that principles that you can be faithful, you will never lack anything. God will make provision. And you have been faithful in your sowing. God sees that. That goes into your account. That is your future. Your future is secure because there are angels that are behind and in front of you. And I have not seen a righteous man abandoned nor his children begging for bread. There are difficult times, but not impossible. God always makes provision. So then you have to make time for the Lord. I was reading in uh, an, adult, an adult of a man that was the owner of a uh, company where he sold shoes and behind his desk he had a sign that says God family and shoes now there are folks that look at the sign and they turn it around shoes family and God is last there are some principle if you put the Lord first and he's always in your mouth and you always count on him you wake up in the morning, angels, that I'm heading out without breaks. <laughs> Thank you. I'm heading out. You don't have to pray a lot. Don't be religious. Oh, Lord, have mercy. No. You know that there are folks that think that a prayer is a resume of a half hour. No, that's quick. Dressing yourself up, combing your hair. Angels, I'm heading out and I know I'm going to be triumphant. And you get in your vehicle and you're heading out. I'll receive that. Confessing the word. My burden is light and easy. He doesn't give you a load you can't carry. This is easy. Don't convert something that's easy and make it difficult. Christian life is easy. There are a bunch of folks out there that say, brother, the Christian life is very difficult because they were misled. Number three is the athlete that is crowned has to compete legitimately. We've mentioned it already, but that's number three. God or Paul here presents an athlete that competes legitimately. You've seen those races where they disqualified the winner because they discovered that in the race, he, he when he turned the corner, he sat down to rest or he tripped somebody and they, they, they discover it after the fact. And he is in crown legitimately. Fight the good battle of faith properly. And the last point that calls my attention, notice that he compares us here as soldiers. And then he mentions the businesses of life and as an athlete and now as a farmer. Look at the example that he uses. The farmer, to take part of the fruits, he must labor first. So the farmer must labor to be a partaker of the fruit. You know that I understand that the Christian life, that when you come, you begin to receive revelation and the word begins to accommodate itself in your mind and you begin to confess it, becomes a part of your life and you begin to sow as a good farmer. You begin to sow the word and confess the word and it seems like nothing is happening. You say, I am healed, I am prosperous and... Your car is up for re repo, uh, a repo, and you say, Lord, that works for others, but it doesn't work for me. The others are also uh, farming, and uh, they are reaping. But listen, it comes a time when the ground, that seed breaks ground, and once, and once that seed of yours breaks ground, the ground now it's fertile. And now when you plant your seed again, it's going to reap immediately. 
I've seen that take place in my life. I've been faithful to the word. I speak the word. I teach the word. I eat the word. I preach the word. I have those signs that the word may be spread. It's a word, not God, because God is in his rest. What has to be spread is his word. God isn't going to help you. What helps you, it's his word. And I've seen in the beginning, I would go through some heavy trials where my flesh would come against me. That's not working. Hey, continue confessing. Things are not going well. Finances, this other thing here is not going well. But the word, it is written. I believe it. It is written. I believe it. Maintaining your confession. Now, there was a time that when that seed broke ground, listen, there's not any infirmities that can come against me. I'm saying it comes, but it loses the battle. No, I've received whatever is written in the book I've gotten, but I begin to fight the good battle of faith. I've sown this word. I've sown it in you. I've sown it in others. And uh, to those that are beside me, to everyone I've sown this word. Apparently, in the beginning, it was tough, it seemed like. But you're not sowing for anything. You are sowing for a lifestyle that will remain with you forever. And once you reap, the harvest doesn't decrease. It grows more and more and more. It begins to grow. That's why it says there, Timothy, think and consider what I'm telling you, that may God give you understanding in all things. The farmer, in order to be a partaker of the fruit, should labor first. The harvest takes time, but once harvested, you have to keep relying on the word. Know that I've been here three years. Three years? I've been more than 20 confessing it. But it works. It works. Listen, 20 years. Sometimes you go through 80 years and what you're wasting, you wasted 80 years. You die. Who died there? Well, some uh, alley cat. How many family members of yours that, that were born, they ate, they slept, they woke up, they worked? They died. And everything ended there. Your family members, is that the same result you want for you? Here, we sow, but when harvested, there is a lifestyle for you, something firm. Your work in the Lord is not in vain. You have to sow for your account because there are things that you sow that you're going to reap. Notice what Paul tells Timothy my son, Timothy, may God give you understanding in all things. But the farmer, in order to reap, he has to sow. You have to sow in everything. If you want a good friendship, you have to cultivate it. You want something marvelous, you have to cultivate it. Whatever you want, you have to cultivate. Things just don't come out like this. It would be nice to hit the lotto. Ah, oh, then there, you don't have to show nothing. You hit it, but that's a million and one. You know how many temples I would have purchased with what they've offered me? I'm saying not temples, but buildings, I correct myself. You know how many persons have told me, I'll buy the television station if I hit the lotto. But that is uncertain. But when you sow, when you read, when you do something, a little at a time. You know how many messages I've taught from here to reap those testimonies that we are hearing in our radio station? That's why when that program airs, anyone interrupts me, I can insult them because I'm seeing the harvest of many years of sowing seed. You saw that gentleman that called today? 
He said, Apostle, I come from a Pentecostal church in Puerto Rico, a very legalistic red bone. <laughs> red bone church. Brother, that is rebuking demons and casting out demons day and night. And he said that one night he went and hid in a park somewhere. And since he used drugs, he said, I am going to turn my soul over to Satan to see if he gives me riches. And he was all night. Satan, come upon me. I give you my soul, but give me finances so I can buy good coke and good heroin. What I want is lots of drugs. Take my life. And he got tired. Satan never appeared. And he says, well, why don't you just take my soul? Because I'm all confused. <laughs> and what was it? Through a cassette. And somebody, a blessed brother, gave him a cassette. And he said when he heard that the devil was destroyed, he said, with reason, he never appeared. <laughs> with reason, he never showed up. You liar. Well, I wrote this note here of that summary of the second letter to Timothy. Do not despair or drop your confession. I do not govern myself nor form my destiny. They took me for a soldier, so I am here to fight a good battle, the battle of faith. They may criticize me, but it is my duty to move on and not to waste my time defending myself. I am prosperous and I will succeed in all affairs, but without getting entangled in them. I do not need to hurt anyone to achieve my goals. There are works prepared beforehand exclusively for me. I have sown the word in me and in others, and my confessions are already registered by the angels. They know everything that comes out of your mouth. It is on your account. They have it all registered in their files. That is my account. There is my seed, everything that I've sown, everything I have harvested. Well, the psalmist said, the word is not found or formed yet, and you know what's coming. I declare myself healthy, saved, free, prosperous, and blessed with all blessing that I've sold and I'm going to harvest and you also be loved. <laughs>